All right, give us a hand. Whoa. <laughs> what we have is a really interesting statement here because I hear people all the time, oh, everything's going to be okay. Ever heard that? Everything, everything's just going to be fine. You ever anyone say that to you? Right? Everybody goes, and they go, where are you getting this from? Well, you know, everything's going to be fine. Why? How, how do you say everything's going to be fine? So the question is, where do people get that? Well, if you're of God, everything's going to be fine, right? Where is that in the Bible? Is it in the Bible? Is it what it says? Because we already have this idea that just because God, you know God, that that's all there is, that God will do everything for you. Is that true? You see, the problem is that people think just knowing that there's a God is all that's necessary. So if, if you hire somebody, and you're the employer, and you hire somebody, and they know that you exist, you're still going to pay them, even if you did nothing for them. Is that how it works? Would you, work, would you hire somebody, and they don't show up for work, they don't do anything to help you, they don't see from your perspective, they don't care about what you have or what you need, and they expect you to be paid? You understand the problem here? So what we're going to be covering is, the, the age old, it's all going to be just fine. And that's not always true. And when people say, well, everything's going to be fine. Okay, how do you say that? And for what reason do you say it? Because have you noticed the world is not fine? The, the world is going through some real major problems, and it's not going to get better. But you can be in a bubble, so to speak, with God, and then everything will, but it'll be, and all the problems will be there, but they won't touch you. Does that make sense? So Heavenly Father, I thank you right now for helping me to teach your word, to bring to pass the greatness of your truth in the hearts of your people, to truly walk in your blessings, your protection, because this is the utmost importance, that in every respect their lives can truly glorify you in this day and time, walking in your shadow, in the footsteps of your firstborn from the dead are risen and return, Lord Jesus, your anointed. Okay, so this is the true way of life, but understanding what is true, because we have a lot of stuff in our heads that don't make sense. And most of it didn't come from the Bible. It came from the religious cultures that we all came from, which is the Greek and Roman. Because all you got to do is just believe there's Zeus, and Zeus will come through ex machina. So we're not dealing with ex machina now. We're dealing with what does the word really say, all right? So here we go. Subject matter is all things. What's the subject matter? All things. All things. All. All right, and that's pan, panta, which means no exception, everything. All right, so in 1 Samuel 17, 34, 36, this is when David is talking to Saul. David said to Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came out a lion. Wow, a lion. How, in fact, there was someone that was, that, that was nearby the zoo, and a tiger got out. And it's just walking down the street. And a person walked out of their house, and there was a lion in their front yard. Not a lion, a tiger. And they were like, ah! And they went back in the house. What would you do if you opened the door, and there was a lion there? What would you do if you opened I mean, seriously, you ever had a lion look at you like, like, Looking at you like you were a pork chop? <laughs> I mean, imagine what that do. How many would say that's, that really sucks? That would be a bad day, right? That would be like, oh, no. This, you, well, you won't believe what happened this morning. I got out of my, opened my door, and there was a tiger there, you know. But that just happened a couple days ago. But we're talking about David kept his father's sheep, and there came out a lion. And that's, that's one that's about ready to attack. And imagine something that's about this tall, about this long, and it's looking at you like a pork chop. What do you do? So David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and it came out a lion. That's impressive. That looks like, ouch. You get like someone's going to ruin your whole day. And a bear. Now, that's, that's only eight feet tall. No big deal, right? I mean, he could touch the top of that. That's a, that's a big animal. 
Its paws are about that big. And it's powerful. It usually breaks trunks. And David saw that, and he took care of him. And he took a lamb out of the flock. And what did he do? I went out after him, smote him. That's each one of them. And delivered out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard, smote, and slew him. That's pretty intense. A lion and a what? A bear. Why would God allow him to be threatened by a lion? Why? What's the deal, man? That's, I thought being with God, everything goes perfectly. No, you don't. How many know any weightlifters? You know, guys that would lift weights, right? What, what do they do? Start off with five pounds and stay five pounds? They keep adding it? Why do they add it? Don't you see that? You might like this. Right? Get big muscles. You, you have to keep going more, more, if you're going to attain a certain point. You have to be able to handle each one. And the greatest coach there is, is God. So here we go. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. Okay, I took care of the lion. I took out the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be, what is he talking about? Goliath. That guy is not just the size of the bear. He's also smarter than the bear <laughs> and able to kill a lot of people. I actually did a simulation of his weapons, and they are huge. What you and I would put around a broomstick, our hands, he was putting around a 4x4, four four, so his hands were really large. So how would, you, how would someone 17 years old, how would you take him out? Thy servants slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he defied the armies of the living God. So the question boils down to, why would God let him, how would God have him go through that? Because God has greater, if you're going through challenges, it's because something greater is coming. How many here were kids? Nobody. Okay, kid, you know, when you were younger, right? So when you first got on the bicycle, what happened? You fall down, right? You fall down, you fall down. Why? Because you had a goal in your mind that to, to ride that bicycle, like wherever you saw people do. So you're going to get on it, and you're going to fall off, you're going to fall down, you're going to get bumped, you're going to, you know, scrape your knees. But each time you do it, you get what? Better and better and better. It's either you're, you're, either, you're either learning or you're winning. You know losers. And God's there to make sure that you don't handle nothing more than you can what? Handle. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that agape God. To them who are called according to his purpose. That's where people say, everything's going to be just fine. Well, that's not what this says. That is not what this says. David, when you look at David's life, there was not just, there was two people, two individuals that were both anointed as king. One was Saul, one was who? David. Their job is to protect God's what? People. Where was Saul? Hiding. Afraid. Where was David? I took out the lion, took out the bear, this dude's no problem. Saul, it's like, well, the, the Lord be with you, you know, the horse be with you, whatever. So that's well and good. But understand, who was the real king? Was it Saul or was it David? When it comes down to, people say, everybody says they're of God. Ask them. Yeah, are you of God? Yeah, I'm of God. What does that, what does that mean? What does it mean? People say it, but what does it mean? This verse is extremely important. It's the foundational verse. This comes out of a foundational book called Romans, right? And we know. So we're going to look at this verse a little closer because people always say everything is going to be all right. No, that's not how it works. I wish it was, but it's not true. Okay, now we're going to examine this. I want you to, because English is really bad, Spanish is also bad. Anything that's not, this culture this, that God gave his word to 
doesn't think like us, it has different priorities, right? Different way of looking at things. So I'm going to help you understand the Hebrew thought behind, all right? I'm going to try and get you to think the Hebrew way. Does that make sense? All right? So we're going to pretend you're, we're going to try and make you go back and be at least 2,000 years old, okay? <laughs> it's like, wow, Frank. Um, okay, here we go. First of all, we're going to start off with the word no. Does everyone know what the word no means? No. No, okay. All right. All right. What does no mean? All right. How many know? How many know there's a Singapore? How many know there's a San Diego? Nobody? Okay, we're, we're in San Diego. Okay, okay, good. All right. Singapore, you know. San Diego, you know. What's the difference? Pardon? One is by experience. 80% of the time, you've seen at least 20% of San Diego, right? So this word is not gnosko. Gnosko is if you've experienced it. This word is not gnosko because it's a foundational scripture. It's Romans. You are hearing the word, but you haven't experienced it yet. So we're talking about we know. Well, what is that? It's the word oida. Oh. It means theoretically or conceptual no. Like you know Singapore, right? But you haven't been there. You haven't experienced it. But San Diego, you know. You've experienced it. That's the word no. Now, the, the, the words are extremely dumb. There's, there's gnosko and there's oida. But oida means basically you've heard about it, but you really haven't experienced it. It's not part of your reality yet. The next one we have is the word together. Everybody knows what together means, but what does the words be, that it's translated from mean? Do they mean together? No, they don't. This word together is really difficult because it's the word synergio. Synergio. You ever heard the word synergy? Synergy is when I take, for instance, I take a gasoline, I have oxygen, and I have a fire. So what should I have? The equivalent of, no, I get an explosion, right? Big difference. So you get more than the sum of the parts. It's very explosive. It's very expansive. It's very, you know, like you ever take uh, um, any, like vinegar and, and baking soda, right? That, that you wind up with more mass than you started with. That's synergy. When you get, you ever have two people get together and all of a sudden it's like they can't be stopped. They just, they keep on going, right? Others, you get two people together, and it's like they can't get along. But if you get the right people together, bang, man, you wind up with more than just this person and that person. You wind up with something even greater. You ever met someone like that? Just when they do so click with them, they can, you could can just accomplish anything, right? That's synergy. So that's what this is. That's together. So we know, we've heard, we know, we have conceptualized that all things that means no matter what happens to you, what synergizes, it becomes greater. All right, so let's look at David's life. He took out the what? The lion. Then he took out the what? Is the bear badder than the lion? Oh, uh, yeah. And then he took out after the lion who? <coughs> Goliath. Is he the same person? Outside, but not inside, right? He was able to do more from what he was able to do before. He constantly expanded and became more capable. So together here, we know all things work what? Together, synergize to create something even greater. For, now there's a humdinger word. So the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So instead of getting two and two and getting four, you wind up with two and two getting six and seven or eight. That's what synergy does. It's called a network effect as well. But anyway... Four, and now we get to this word four. Now, this one totally blew my mind, all right? Well, now, the next one after that did, but this is cool, too. Four, you would think, well, reason, that's not, that's bad translation. The word four is the word ice. All right, can you say ice? Ice, ice right? It's, it's, that's how you Greek spell it, right? Ice. Now, what's weird about ice in the Bible, there's only one ice. 
and it is only in the accusative case. That's it. No other cases. That you know you have you have conjugations. Well, this one only has one. In the whole Bible, there's only one accusative. So when you see I, when Isis is there, and they translate all this thing, they translate it as that, they translate it as for, they translate it for all these things. But look at the Greek, and you go, oh my gosh, it's ice. So what is this? Only use one case. Accusative. Well, you know what accusative is? When I say you, right? So I say you, that's accusative. If I say me, that's genitive. Got it? So this is talking about you individually. You individually. Not everybody, but you, singular, individual. And we know, we all know, that all things work, synergize, to make something even greater than the sum of its parts. For ice, there's a purpose. All right, let's go back to David. What was the purpose? What was that had to be taken care of that was destroying the hearts of God's people? Goliath. To remove that destruction of their hearts. So let's look at this. But the verse we're talking about fits the whole Bible. For ice, ice governs only one case, accusative. Okay, I don't know if you ever took geometry. You ever took geometry? Right? In geometry, you ever heard of Euclid? Euclid? Euclid geometry? All right, Euclid uses ice when it's, he's a Greek. It's drawn to meet another line at a certain point, right? So how many of you have ever, been, ever did a race? You're in the military. You do races, right? Okay, physical fitness training. You got, okay, you start off at the start line, and you have to go to the what? Finish line. And how often can you stop? You can't stop. No stopping. You have, how'd you know that? <laughs> right, so you got this, this finish line, and every step you take, you've got to keep going. Not step, you run like a bunny, but you have to keep running till you get there, and you don't stop until you get to the other line. So you're starting at a finish line. You have an ice, right, a line going from here to the finish line, and you boogie, you, 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 you know, do a massive getaway stick thing, and you run like hell, and you make it to the other side as straight as you can, and when you get there, you're done. Because now you have, ice has to have, in order for there to be ice, there has to be a goal, a finish line. Got it? So everyone, because it's you individually, accusative, have a finish line. Not finish as in Finland, finish as in, you know, end of, that was a joke. Uh, so, okay. Is governs, okay, drawn to meet another line at a certain point. Hence, it denotes motion to, onto an object with the purpose of reaching it or touching it. Got it? So there's a goal that each one, uh, could you call it a destiny? Yes, you have a what? Destiny that's only yours, no one else. That's what this is saying. You have a destiny that's granted by God to reach that point. What's the point? Most of us have no idea what our goal is. And we know, we generally know, that there's a goal, there's a point, that all things, and that means no matter what happens, because from the time you start the start line, to go to the finish line, over here, by the time you get there, no matter what happens in between, so long as you're going that away, everything is going, how many throw rocks, broken glass on the track when you're running? Does that ever happen when you're running? They do? Now, I'm not talking an obstacle course. I'm talking, <laughs> I'm talking when you have a goal, and you usually don't run into it. You run around it. You get around it. You don't, you know, step onto it. The obstacles. But the obstacles are there, but they're there to give you. Why do you have an obstacle course? To make you more skilled, make you more capable. Yes? Okay. Hence, it denotes motion to, onto an object, which is that goal. Okay. And we know, we conceptualize that all things work together, synergize to be something greater for, now here's the next word, good. Got 
Thank you. What's good? Good. How many have a good friend? How many had a good breakfast? Anyone have a good day? We're not talking about that. We're talking about the biblical usage of the word what? Good. What does the Bible mean when it says good? This becomes interesting. Right? So it's the word agathos. When you see the word good, it's agathos. That's not a dog. It just means good. All right, so how would you definitely, how would you condense it really simple in a simple phrase? Objectively pronounced judgment. So what does this mean, objectively? It has nothing to do with anyone's feelings. It has nothing to do with anyone's biases. It's the goal. It's did you make it or not? Because we're talking about going from over here to over there, right? That's your destiny, your goal. you got to make it. And that either you make it or you don't. Either you're making progress to it or you aren't. It's that simple. That's why objective, when it talks about objectivity, what does that mean? That means it's not biased. It's not up to anyone's interpretation, including my own. Pronounced, declared, judgment. You finished. And you are the winner. Got it? At the end of the race, they go, the winner, right? Put a gold medal on you. Orange medal. Yellow medal. All right. Anyway. Is that making sense? All right. So it's object. There's the guy at the at the at the, the goal post or at the, the referee or whatever, sit back there and go, hmm, did he make it? Do I want to give it to him? No, he has no choice. Right? There's no way he can get around this. He says it's safe, right? You ever see the guy at baseball? He goes, safe, right? Or he goes, out, right? It's that, that's that. If he's safe, right, that's an objectively pronounced judgment. Bang, it's done. Got it? Well, who's the one that's going to do that? Who? Who's going to do it? All right, so we know. And we know all things work together for good. Good. Objectively pronounced judgment. Yes. Safe, whatever. To them, that what? Ooh. So we're now we're going to find out what we're going to do a little bit more about good before we get to that point. Right, good. Now, everybody goes, everybody knows who's good. Maybe some people that are good. Who's some good people you know? Anyone know? Now, I can, now the Bible says Joseph of Arimathea was good way after he'd already died. So he did his what? He approached, he accomplished his goal, his destiny. See what I'm saying? That's why it says Joseph and Thea was good, because it was written after he died. And he says, yes, he was a good man. And God's word says so. There it is. But Jesus was not good. While he was on earth before he died, he was not good. People are like, what do you mean he wasn't good? No, he wasn't good. Paul says he wasn't good. What do you mean he wasn't good? He wasn't good. Why? Are you good? Are you good? Is she good? Is she good? He's not saying anything. <laughs> Is he good? No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> not enough. <laughs> All right. All right. Matthew 19, 16, and 17. <coughs> this is from Matthew concerning Jesus Christ. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master. That's what he called Jesus. Good. What good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is who? God. Why call me good? There is none good. Only God. Why does it say God is good? God is good. All right. Okay. God's good. What does that mean? You ever heard that before? God's good. What does it mean? Everybody walks on. God is good. Oh, great. And what does that mean? He loves me. He loves me. Of course he's good. He loves me. If he didn't love me, he wouldn't be good. All right. Now, that ain't going to work. That doesn't work. All right. Let's tell. How is God good? 
Now, how important is this to understand? Because we're not into religion, we're into biblical what? Research. What does the scripture say? How is God good? It is God who gives objectively pronounced what? Judgment. He will judge us when it's all over. When, we've, when it comes to the end, did we do good or did we not? Objectively pronounced judgment as to a course, a direction, a judgment, an action, a response, or an outcome. That's how it's used. Then when you're talking about good, it's all subjective. But you have any good, uh, see a good movie lately? Read a good book lately? Right? Well, that's your opinion. Walk into a movie place. It's kind of like, I want to watch a good movie. Oh, I got one for you. Here, watch this. Oh, pff, I haven't seen a good movie ever. So who's making the judgment? If it's God, it's going to be totally different. So God makes the judgment, and it always pertains to a goal. What is the goal? What is the destiny? What is the direction? What is the ultimate end? And you personally have a what? Destiny. And either you accomplish it or you don't. Either you are running fast to get to it or you're walking slow. Or maybe you're just meandering. Right? Everybody's got their own destinies. I'm interested in fulfilling mine. So in Genesis, we're going to see this happen. And God said, let there be what? Light. All right. And there became, there's no was, and there became what? Light. Ah. And God saw. The word saw is examine. Examine it. Hmm. Let's see if it fits. If all right. Yep. Yeah, that's good. That's good. See it? God examines it. So, our life comes to an end, which will hopefully be as extended as long as possible. Did you fulfill your destiny? Did you accomplish what is expected of you? And God saw the light that it was good. God saw your life at the end and said, that's good. We're going to do a repeat. Come on, get up. Does that make sense? And God divided the light from the darkness. So God examines it, and it is declared good. So that's the process of what God does to judge. He makes that judgment call, but not during your life, but at the what? End. And how did he judge Jesus? He judged him good. Not during his life, but when he ended it. God says, and got him up from the what? Ah, one, two, three. Ah. So let's go back to our original. Good, which is agathos. All right, objectively pronounced judgment as, as to the whole shebang, the whole enchilada. The enchiladas aren't that long. I mean, I'm just saying <laughs> from, from the beginning to the end, right? The, the fulfillment of your destiny, okay? Okay, now we take down, now we have love, right? Anyone been in love? I've been in love. Oh, oh, right? We've all been in love, okay? Or maybe we think we're in love. Anyway, this is not love, okay? It says, Frank, it says love. I don't care what it says. We're not talking about the English, we're talking about the Greek. What is the Greek? The Greek has a different word. It's not love, as you and I think of it. It's the word agapeo, which comes from the word agape. And we all, I beat this in your heads all the time, right? This is not love, it's not love, it's not love. It's what? Mental perception, accept, mental perceptual acceptance and responsive what? Compliance. Remember my little example of the little kid, right? A little mini person, rug rat, curtain climber, sitting back there, he's got a little hard candy in his mouth. All of a sudden it falls out, hits the ground, and I see him. He picks it up, he goes to put it in his mouth, I go, don't do that! And he goes, what? what? Don't put that back in your mouth. Why? It's got bugs on it. Well, I don't see any bugs. There's bugs on it. Now, he's got to hear that and mentally what? 
perceived bugs, whatever that word bugs means to him, has got to see it on there, even though it's not there. I mean, there is bacteria, but we call it bugs. And he's going to do what I tell him to. And that's the response of compliance. He's going to what? Throw it away. And that's what agape is. You can't see it, but you accept it because that who is greater than you told you, advised you, directed you, and then you take their statement and you see it and then you act on it. Got it? Parents do that to the children all the time. And the children respond. You know how many years it took me to come up with a definition like that? <laughs> I had to check, ver check, verify, and go through every every instance. Mental perception, mental perceptual acceptance, and responsive compliance. And that's, now here's the biggest one. You ready? Here we go. Purpose. So we have what God says. We're acting on his declaration of our personal, what? Destiny. We're, we're, we're either walking like a turtle or we're running like a banshee, right? To get to our destiny. Or maybe we're dancing, you know? Who knows? But anyway, either we're still, if we're making any progress, we'll see when it, it's over how we're doing. But anyway, so we go, all things work to the good, synergized for that which is our destiny, which is God's purposes, His to them that what? Agape. They adjust their thinking, align it with God, accept His realities, and act on it. So again, there's that action. There's that movement toward your goal. Does that make sense? So you're always heading that way. To them who are called according to His purpose. Now we're down to purpose. These people are not just the average Joe Schmidlap, right? These are people that are committed, have agape for God. They are oriented toward their destiny. They have a goal. They're heading toward it. That's what this is talking about. The word purpose is weird. People say, how weird, okay? It's weird. How weird. <laughs> okay, how weird? A prothesis. Do you know what a prothesis is? There's prosthesis and there's prothesis. But this is, they're both from the same word. Prosthesis and prosthesis are the same thing. We're supposed to be prostheses for God. What? 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 We're supposed to be God's prostheses. Is that weird or what? What's wrong? Can't God speak for himself? Nope. Who's the only one that can speak for him? Well, can't God do anything? His only hands are what? Ours. His only voice is ours. Why did God need Moses? He needed someone who would be his what? Prothesis. He doesn't need him today, does he? Oh, yeah. Sure do. That's why God, the miracles are right around the corner. All someone's got to do is recognize they're supposed to be God's oracles. His spokesman. His, his hands. His mouth. God doesn't have a mouth. Anyone notice that God doesn't have a mouth? Anyone notice that? God doesn't have a mouth. He's, he's pneuma, spirit. God doesn't have legs. He doesn't have feet. So who do these things for him? We do. You never thought of yourself as a prosthesis, did you? I'm God's prosthesis. <laughs> you ever put on a prosthesis, go put on a prosthesis and it goes, no, I don't want to. I'm going to do my own thing. And it goes hopping away. You know <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> I couldn't believe it when I saw it. I'm like, what? Well, I wanted to check on how that word came to be. I wanted to go back even, you know, break it even further down. So 
it means lay down steps. Isn't that weird? Lay down steps. Why? Because when you have a prosthesis, something that is, that is taking the place of you doing it, then it's done by what? Steps, stages, step by step by step by step. Each, you can't go from here to there. You got to do one, two, three, four, right? You got to do four steps. No goal is accomplished by one big jump, one big step. It's done by what? Steps. Step by step. Step by step. Step by step. You can't get there. You have to have something to take you there. And that would be that which lays it out step by step. How many drive a car? Why didn't you walk here? Because that car became the prosthesis for your legs. Because it can do better than you can do. Why do you have binoculars? They're prosthesis for your what? Your eyes. Why, why not just use your own eyes? Because you can't do that far. Make sense? So it's not like a prosthesis is that physical thing. It's that which accomplishes it for it. If you drove a car, your car is your prosthesis. Rather than using your legs, you use the car. Got it? Pardon? Faster, quicker, it was able to get it done. How many use a calculator? Why don't you use your own brain? Your calculator is a what? Prothesis. It's, it's that which does it for you. Rather than using your own brain, you use it. It's all making sense. Isn't that weird? I was like, what? With what? That's where it is. And this word thesis comes from the word steps. And pro means to forward, move one step at a time, to lay down steps. That's all it means. So when you go, okay, how many steps is it going to take me from here to there? It's going to take me about 30 steps. Okay, here's one, two, three. You understand? It's step by what? Step. And if this isn't good enough, I'll get someone to get me there faster. Does that make sense? Like when a little girl sister goes, I'm ready to be a mommy and a, and a wife. She's only six. The answer is, no, you're not. <laughs> she needs to take what? Steps. Each one. Yeah, that's a great, you know, focus, but not now. You need to work on other things like learning how to cook, you know, you know, take care of other things. <coughs> Doing it right now is not going to work. She needs to build up her skills and ability. Yes? How many just never learned any skills and just went and got, how successful is that going to work? It isn't, right. Okay. That's, now, I know that looks weird. That's taken from the um, Egyptian uh, necropolis from the second, you know, first century. What they did is they had coffins and they put pictures on it. And this one coffin has a Semitic face. So I'm going to use it for my example, okay? That doesn't mean it is Joseph. I'm going to say it is, okay? Just for a focus, all right? So yes, it is an Egyptian. Yes, he has a Semitic features. So more likely he comes from that kind of lineage from Joseph. But so anyway, but I want now Israel. Now here's where, how many of you have read this verse? Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was a son of his old age and made him a coat of many colors. Ever heard that? You ever wondered what it means? How many think they already know what it means? Ever wonder what it means? Israel, that's Jacob, loved. The word love, what's the, what's the Greek word for love? For love? God's love. Agape, having God's thoughts, God's images. What's the Hebrew word? I have. All right. I have. It's the word, Greek word agape. I don't. Again, it's that mental, conceptual, and with physical response, right? Now, the next one is son of his old age. Oh, boy. This is a phrase that doesn't mean what it says. <laughs> it's like, it does, but it's not what it means. All right. 
son of his old age. The problem is that foolishness is in youth and wisdom is in what? Old, right? So the wisdom goes with being, uh, being older. Foolishness goes with being what? Younger. What this is saying, that of all his children, that he has so much wisdom to impart, only one listened to him. Only one adopted and did what he said and followed his example and learned. And guess who that was? Joseph. So old age means progeny of his what? Wisdom. Okay. Now here's another one that's really weird. This word coat doesn't mean coat. Right. What is it? Well, the Hebrew word, if you look at the Hebrew word, is kotonet. Kotonet. Okay, what does that mean? Is that a donut? No, it's a kotonet. <laughs> Almost like a cross between a crouton. No, no, no. It's a kotonet. All right. So what is that? A kotonet has nothing to do with a coat. It's a long shirt-like garment, usually of what? Linen. Remember when David says, bring me the ephod? That's it. It's another way of saying ephod. This is kotonet. It's a long um, one piece, like a nightgown, I guess you might say. You, know, you ever seen those old fashioned nightgowns where you just, you just put it over your whole head and just, I don't know if you ever did that. I'm not talking about bunny suits. I'm talking about, you know, you know, bunny suits have those little flaps in the back. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, right? This is a cotonet, right? If you're Roman Catholic, it's called an alb, but all right. Now, the next word is colors. What color is that? Linen is what color? White. So where do they get colors from? I have no idea. It doesn't make any sense. But the translators got totally confused. The word colors, all right, how, look at your palm, right? Now, if I, if I had you take off your shoe and look at your foot, you'll notice that there's two parts to your, to your foot. There's the, <coughs> the ball of your foot, and the heel, what do you call that part in the middle? An arch, right? Does it look like this? This word for this, and that which is between your ball, your foot, and the heel, is the same word in Hebrew. Didn't know that, did you? All right. So colors is in colors. What the word is, is pas. It means your palm of your hand or the palm of your foot, the arch. I mean, it's kind of like Spanish. You got dedos on your fingers and you got dedos on your toes. <laughs> no, I'm serious. The Spanish don't have fingers. They got digits. So but anyway, the Hebrew has a similar situation. It has, it has a palm in your hand and a palm in your foot. It just means that place between your ball of your and your heel, that arch. Same thing as your palm. It goes, curves in. So this long shirt-like garment, usually of linen, and it goes down to the palms of your hands. So that means it goes all the way down and comes across the palms and goes all the way to the floor to where, the, where your arch is. It's a full-length garment. It's also called an ephod. So what does that mean? Every time someone wanted to go before God, what did they always do? Put on a what? Ephod. They wash themselves, change their garments, and put on an ephod and go to God. That's all they would wear would be the ephod. That's it. And they would go to God. David did that after Ziglag. He goes, give me an ephod. <laughs> and he put the ephod on and went to God and said, God, I'm sorry. Help me. And God showed him what to do. Right? So the ephod's like really valuable when you want to go before God. It helps you get your mind set. It conditions you to think only about God while you're wearing it. And so the question is, what is, why is this given to Joseph? What's going on here? Well, first of all, who's in charge of the family? Who's in charge of the family? Right? 
whose name is Jacob, right? Another name for Jacob is Israel. He's the man of God, right? He's the father, the head of the house. Who's supposed to be wearing the ephod? Who goes to God for his family? Remember in Job, what did he do? He went daily to God for his what? His family. He would have put on an ephod and went to God. So this responsibility is not for the children. It's for the what? The adult. When someone, when you get together and you get together to pray, who does the praying, the children or the adult? The father should be the one praying, not the children, because they have no idea what they should pray for. They don't even know how to pray. You can have them pray separately, but if you're praying as a group, the one who's spiritually mature and in charge does the praying. Well, here, the person in charge is Jacob, which is called Israel here, and he's supposed to be wearing the ephod. If not him, then it's the what? Firstborn, which is who? Reuben. He's supposed to be second in charge. He didn't give it to Reuben. And then he's got ten other kids. He didn't give it to them either. What did he give it to? Joseph. He's the squirt. I mean squirt. You know, the little guy. Mini person. He's the youngest. No offense. You know what I mean? <laughs> right? So he got this thing. So who goes to God for the family? Who goes and checks with God? Joseph. Why? Because he is the son of his wisdom. The progeny of his wisdom. Everything he had, Joseph understood and knew. And that's why he gave him the ephod to go for his family. How many got someone in your family who's really spiritually sharp, right? And you go, okay, I'm going to let you make this, you know, you go to them because they're the sharpest, right? Well, when it comes down to Jacob and his sons, the only one who's sharpest is Joseph. He's the razor, right? He's got it down. Everything that that Jacob knew, Joseph knew, and Joseph would go to God daily for his father and his mother and his brothers. If there's anything he could do, assist, to help, or whatever. God's got a wonderful heart, but that's what that's all about. A commitment to God concerning his family. Really serious. He's really committed. And Jacob didn't even think twice about it. just gave it to Joseph. What is Joseph's destiny that he's doing? Becoming a great man of what? To be God's what? Azir. He's taking it all extremely seriously. He's not skipping a beat. His fa everything his father knew, he got. Everything his father understood, he got. Every responsibility his father had, so he was his father's what? Azir. And wound up being even better than his father father. Does that make sense? That's why we have no idea how to translate it because we have no such thing in our culture. But I want you to understand it. If you ever read a book on Orientalisms of the scriptures, it's a really good book. Helps you understand what the, how that works. Anyway, so let's go into a little bit about Joseph. And just, now remember, David had a bad day, right? What was his bad day? Well, he came across what? A lion, right? Then later on, he came across a what? A bear, which is like a little bit higher, higher up the level here. Then he had to take on a what? Right. Uh, now, so you could say all things that David went through was to get him closer to his what? Closer to his what? His destiny, his goal, what God said he was, right? All right, so I promised you a break. We're going to do, all right, 37. How many want to break right now and then we'll come back? Does everybody make sense? Does it make sense what I've explained to you so far? All things work to good of them. Okay, so what if you reversed it? Where, let's go back and, and, and check that out. Oh my gosh, where's my magic clicker? There it is. All right. So let's, if the best way to test something is do a reverse. Let's go back here. Bang, bang. All right? And we, we know that. All things work together for good to them 
that, okay, what's the negative of that? All things work together. All things do not work together, right? Do the reverse, the opposite, right? All things do not work together for good to them that do not agape God, to them who are not called according to his what? Purpose. So people say, well, everything's going to be all right. Well, that, the question is, is, is God's orientation, priorities, perspective, and value system the same as theirs? Do they have the same, do they, they value God's perception of reality more than their own? That's the question. So when we're talking about this, it has nothing to do with, with you know, just, well, I know God. I mean, I know, a person says, well, I know Mary Posta. She's going to be there for me all the time. I said, does she know you? Right? Mary Posta may not always be there. So just be, if you have someone, your car breaks down, right? And, you know, the guy says, well, you know, you know Miguel, right? Yeah, I know it's a Miguel. So automatically his car's fixed. No, it doesn't work like that. Manuel, Miguel. <laughs> oh, man, Miguel. I got too much. Yeah. They call me senior citizen. Anyway, so. <laughs> Mental perception, acceptance, and responsive compliance to who? To God. To the world? No, to God. And that's where you're going to be able to ask God, and God will give you a what? Answer. If you're asking God and not getting an answer, it's because one of these is missing. Because God wants you to accelerate. He wants you to make it to your destiny. He's there to get you going. But if you're going off, off in the left field or right field or going the opposite way, he's not going, until you start going right, he's not going to help you because you've already gone the wrong way. This is making sense. So for you and God to work together, you're greater than God by himself and yourself by it. But together you can accomplish the impossible. Does that make sense? And that's really something when you look at David, who was how old? How old was David? 17. How old are you? Yeah. 18. Well, he's about, he's, you're a little older than him. And what was he able to do? Imagine her taking on a lion, taking him out, and a bear, right? This guy's like nine feet tall, and she's like, no sweat, I got him. <laughs> You understand? That's the intensity of this because you and God synergize. You become greater than what you could be, and your God is able to accomplish more with you. If it wasn't a Jesus Christ, what could God accomplish? If there wasn't a Moses, what would God accomplish? See the problem? God needs a prosthesis. That sounds weird, doesn't it? <laughs> He's not lacking anything. He just needs us because he has no rights to interfere in this world. Unless we accept that responsibility. Remember, he gave it all over to Adam, and Adam totally and junked it. So, this making sense? Okay. We covered this already. And it's not in his old age because he lived another. <laughs> 130 some years. <laughs> it's like he didn't need to worry about his old age, I assure you that. All right. But it's a prodigy of his what? Wisdom. I mean, really, have you ever met someone who's like nine years old and really, really wise? They're rare. It ain't happening. Have you ever met someone who's in their 50s or 60s that's really wise? The answer is what? Yes. So we understand. How, people say, well, if you see a young person who's very mature, then you go, whoa, that's an old soul. It refers to someone being wise. Does that make sense? 37. Genesis 37. We're going to continue on this, the account. Verse, verse 37, verse 4. And when his brethren saw that their father Ahabd, Right? That's the form of agape, Hebrew form of agape. Him more than all his brethren, they loved him. No, they didn't. They what? Hated him. Why? Because if Reuben wasn't going to get it, I'm sure each one thought that they would get it, but it didn't. It went right to who? 
Were they interested in God? No. They were interested in the position of authority. The problem when having a hierarchy of any sort is that people that are hungry for power and authority want that. They're called sociopaths. They want, they hunger for that. And when they go for it, that's why they say, well, religion's evil. No, it's the sociopaths who wind up in power in that structure. Politics is evil. No, it's the sociopaths who are gravitated toward it and get into that position of authority and power. Well, the police department's evil. No, it's the sociopaths who, are, who want that authority and power. You understand? It's never the position, it's the people's hearts. You can't say a whole group of people, every Mexican's, you know, no, you can't do that. Every American, no, you can't do that. People in a hierarchy, hierarchical uh, organization, sociopaths are drawn to, and politics is massive. Same thing with government, or, or same thing with the military, or same thing with religion. You have a hierarchy, and whenever you have a hierarchy, you automatically, every single sociopath gravitates towards so they can assert their authority over someone else. And that's not how God works. Got it? The, everybody is under God. And, no, and everybody is basically, all men are created what? Equal, created. Remember? Spirit of God, created equal. All right. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all of the other brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Now, how many have brothers and sisters? Anyone have brothers and sisters? How many have your brothers and sisters hate you? You ever had that happen? Now, I, I got this really fine little brother, Mark. Right? I don't know if you've, you've had a... My brother and me had disagreements, okay? Like he would put a, a tarantula in my shoe... He would put snakes in my bed, and I would beat the living daylights out of him. Then my mother would beat the living daylights out of me for beating up my little brother. I'm like, you don't understand. <laughs> he almost burned the house down twice, and I tried to put it out. My mother thought I did it. I don't, I don't, I didn't tell it was my brother. So she thought I was a sociopath or some sort. You know, like, just trying to destroy it. It wasn't me. My brother was just weird like that. Anyway. So when your brothers do something evil to you, my brother loved me, but he still would do things like, you know, put snakes in my bed. And Oh, the greatest thing was he put super glue, back then it was called epoxy, in my shoe. And when I put my shoe, my, put my foot in my shoe, it was weird because I couldn't move it in my shoe. And all of a sudden I went to take my shoe off and I couldn't get my shoe off. You ever had someone put epoxy in your shoe? I had to go to the hospital to get my shoe off. They had to cut off my shoe. So, I mean, that's my little brother. He's quite impossible. So, now imagine having 10 of these. My brother loved me. They hate him. So, and Joseph, now understand, remember Matthew, where it talks about prosuche, not prosuche, where it talks about a, a dioko, right? Dioko can either be a person pursuing you to get you off the word, or pursuing you to follow your example, right? It has nothing to do with being evil. Persecution just means you have a dioko, someone focusing like a laser on you. How many have someone you're teaching? One, two, that's it? No one else you're teaching? You're not teaching it? Anyone not teaching? Oh, three, four, okay. So when you're teaching somebody, God has to give you revelation to help you fill in the blanks that you desperately have. <laughs> and you don't realize it until someone asks you a question. You're like, I don't know about that. <laughs> and you find out, and all of a sudden, God gives you more understanding. Does that make sense? So when you have someone who is diocoing you, whether good or bad, you always get what? Revelation. So here, he gets revelation. Joseph dreamed a dream. Now, People have dreams all the time, and when they tell me the dreams, I can tell them really quick whether it's biblical or if it's the psychological. And most of the time, people have psychological dreams, usually from a movie they watched the night before. You know? So the ones that are biblical are going to have certain key usages of words and how they're used. But if it's of the world, it's just going to be pretty much easier to figure out. But anyway... 
So he received revelation. He envisioned a vision. It should be a better translation. And he told to his brethren, and they hated him yet more. He said unto them, now watch carefully what God has given him. This is his what? Remember that? The starting and the what? The, the destiny, right. That your starting point to your what? So God's showing him the what? Destiny, the end result, right? God always gives you the end from the what? Right. He gives you that which is going to be the end so you know which direction to go toward. And Joseph dreamed a dream, or vision a vision, and told his brethren, and they hid him yet more. And he said to them, Here I pray you this vision which I have dreamed, or envisioned. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. Now that's, that's, these terms are all biblical. Now if you get dreams about sheaves in the field, then you're going to have my attention. If it's not, then we're going to go to the standard, you know, what do you experience, what do you value, what do you fear? And Joseph dreamed, of, okay, my binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and behold, your sheep stood around about and made obstinance to my sheep. That means your labors, all your labors, he says, is going to be to honor me. You're going to bow. Your labors is to bow down to me. He's like, they were like, really, little brother. And his brethren said to him, shall thou indeed reign over us? Or shall thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. All right, so the more you get a, a um, dial code, the more you get what? Revelation, right? And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I've dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon. What does the sun and the moon mean? And the eleven stars, that's his brethren, made obstinance to me. And he told to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall, thou, shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to... So obviously his brothers knew how to interpret this. They've been taught. J Jacob knew because he knew that it was referring to the sun and the moon, which is him and his wife, or Joseph's mother. So it's teaching you how to interpret revelation. God will always speak in line with his what? His word. Does that make sense? So when you go and you go to God and you get this wild ass dream, wild dream, when you get this dream, how do you interpret it? You interpret it with the word if it's from God. If it doesn't match up with the word, then it's a psychological thing. It's something you watch, emotions you feel, situations you encounter. All right, and his brethren envied him, and his father observed the same. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Jacob said to Joseph, do not, do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said unto him, here am I. And he said unto him, go, and pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he went him out of the vale the vale of Hebron and came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, What seekest thou? What are you doing? Walking running around. He said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where, where they feed flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to what? Kill him. Kill him. My brother never considered killing me. I thought about a couple times killing him, but that's not true. I, <laughs> I defended him with my life. But do you understand can you imagine having 11 brothers who all want you dead? How many think you've had a rough childhood? How about 11 brothers that want you dead? Wow. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit, 
and we will say, some evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams, his visions. Is that going to stop God? So let's look at this. He's going to have, he has opposition from who? Who is he getting opposition from? His own what? How many had your own family get on your case? Your own family trying to stop you. Your own family trying to switch your thinking and try and get you to be like everybody else. Well, well, well. Well, in verse 21, Reuben, that's the old brother, oldest brother, heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. Good idea. Really sharp. Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, and ca but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren, they stripped co Joseph of his what? Coat. What's the coat? The ephod, right. That's that garment. So he was wearing it. He just got through doing his response to God. And his father said, check on your brother. And he left it on. That's cool. And they took it, his, his, his ephod that was on him. And they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty and there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat bread. Lifted up their eyes and look and behold a company of Ishmaelites came down from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we, kill, we slay our brethren and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brethren were content. Now, how would you like to have brothers like that? Then there passed by Midianite merchantmen. Now, Midianites are different from the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites usually do the caravan. The Midianites were on the caravan, their part. Now, I've done a lot of research on Midians. They produce the top Azirs in the world. A lot of the kings of the ancients had Midianite Azirs. So Joseph now has moved from being an Azir of his father to being a professional what? Professional what? Azir. He's going to be trained. Well, how long is he going to be under their training? To go from where they're going, remember everybody travels at a screaming speed of what? One and a half miles an hour. So they're going to take about three to six months to get where they're going. <laughs> from where they're at to get to Jerusalem, to uh, Egypt. So it's going to be a long journey. So he's going to get plenty of training. So now he's sold into what? Slavery. And the Midianites are going to pick him up. So if you had your brothers try and kill you, and they sold you as a slave, and you became a slave, would that be a bad day? Now, if all of a sudden, now you're getting trained by experts, that might not be so bad. So, where are we down? Um, they sold him to, to the Midianites and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver and they brought Joseph into Egypt. All right, so now let's move into and Joseph 39.1. Turn the page. Now, understand, this is like, how many have had a bad day in the last week? How many were like, oh, man, you won't, I mean, the last two weeks for us has been intense, seriously. And, and it's just like we had people that just appeared out of nowhere and was able to bless us. You know, I was like, wow. How many have had a bad day and had someone show up and, and bless you, right? I've heard stories about all of you being blessed by each other, which is really cool. But here, Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hand of the Ishmaelites, which brought him down thither. And now the question is, how could God be with him if he's been almost killed by his brothers, sold into slavery, and is now a slave? How could God, why isn't God with him? It's what? God is, it says, and the Lord was with Joseph. Then why did God allow it? Why did God allow it? 
he has to grow. He has to learn. He has to be challenged. He has to be able to do more than what he's done in, under his father and brothers. Does that make sense? How many have been challenged in the last six months and overcame that challenge and go, yeah, right? You ever feel like that? Yeah. This thing was like, and you got it. You got it. And then you go on to something else. Every time you take a challenge and you beat it, you get better. You take the next challenge and you get better, just like David with the lion, then the what? The bear, then Goliath. Now he enters into what? His brothers try and kill him. He gets sold into slavery. Now he's a slave, but the Lord was with Joseph. Why doesn't God do anything? He's not going to do anything. God focuses not on the outside, but on the what? The inside. Where's the strength? Where's the courage? Where's the fortitude? You've got to be able to withstand that which occurs on the outside. And you've got to have that structure inside that does not bend, does not break. Does that make sense? And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. Well, he's a slave. How can he prosper being a slave? How can you prosper being a slave? In the military, what, if being, when I was in the military, what was I, what was I really? Did, could I go where I wanted to go? No. Nope. Could I wear what I wanted to wear? Could I do what I wanted to do? No. I was a what? Slave to my country. <laughs> That's not, they say, go and die. I go, okay. And off I went. It's just the way it went. I volunteered for all the stupid things. But that's how you grow. You become, you take on a challenge and you overcome it. Does that make sense? So here, the Lord was with Joseph. God works from the what? Okay, try again. God works from the, there we go, there we go. From the what? Inside, inside out. out. Right. Not from the outside in. Man does that. God don't. God works from the inside out. So the Lord was with Joseph. How could God be with Joseph? Because Joseph never let go of his goal. What is the word that he got from God? That his father, his mother, and his brethren are all going to what? Bow to him. And that he would be the steward over them. He would be the zero over them, which is not much different than when he was there. But And he was a prosperous man. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So he became the most highly exalted slave. His clothes he wore, the privileges he had, it was just everything he wanted, he got. And the master saw that the Lord was with him. Knowing that it was God with him, but it became evident God works from the inside what? Oh, and people should recognize that in you. They should say, whoa, you're awesome. Have you ever had someone say that to you? You're, you are just unbelievable. I've never met anyone like you before. That should be your calling. I mean, it should precede you when you're in the room. I've heard about you. <laughs> That's the way it should be. And that the Lord made all that he did to what? Prosper. He never let go of God, and God never let go of him. The only way God lets go of you is if you let go of him first. Does that make sense? And the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hands. Joseph found grace. That still refers to identity. Grace in his sight. He saw him as a man of who? God. If I asked all your friends what they thought of you, how many would say, oh, that's a man or woman of God? Isn't that interesting? Does everybody know that you represent God? The truth of God's word, does everybody know that? Or do you keep it a secret? Joseph never kept it a secret. In fact, everybody witnessed it. And that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hands. And Joseph found Kadis. That's the identity. This is the Hebrew word for that. In his sight. And he served him. And he made him overseer over his what? House. 
and all that he, Potiphar, had he put into his hands. And it came to pass from that time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessings of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. Why would a God take care of someone like Potiphar and all he had? Because it has to do with one person. Who is that? Joseph. Where do you work? If wherever you work, that should be the most prosperous of all. Your being there is that person or that business's access to God to know things that no one else could know. Because you're there. Because you have access to who? And they don't. You are their cell phone to God. He blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field, and he left all that he had in Joseph's hands. And he knew not ought what he had. He didn't know what he got. I don't know. That's Joseph. He knows. He doesn't even know. Totally trust Joseph. Has anyone ever put everything they've got in your hands, knowing that full well was going to be taken care of? They should. And knew not ought what he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was goodly. What's goodly mean? You look at him and say, you're goodly. No, my name is George Goodly. No, what does the goodly mean? Goodly. You bring to pass God's what? Will. Remember? And God says, it is what? Good. You're bringing it to pass. That's what Joseph. Joseph is known to bring God's will to pass. And that's what it means to be goodly. It's not a last name. It just means that he is good, bringing the word of God to pass, going back to Genesis. Right? See how the Bible interprets itself? This is like really exciting. And not that he had saved the bread which he did eat, and Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. That word favored goes with the word, um, where is it? Da -da 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 -da. Grace. There it is, grace. So this and this is the same word. They just use two different words. It means the identity. If you were to walk up to party for you said, do you have one godly? You know anyone godly? He goes, yes, my azir. It's Joseph. I, whatever I put in his hands, I don't have to worry about anything. Everything's taken care of. Now that's intense. It would be, like, for instance, a smile and a laugh. Mm -hmm. But you understand? It's, it's not identical. Highly related. You can't laugh until you first smile. Does that make any sense? So they are related, but they're not the same, but they are strongly related. Because it refers to his identity and people responding to that identity I'm not, I want God's favor, so I'm going to do things to make you happy. And I know everything I put in your hands is going to be taken care of because God's with you. I mean, that's the identity that people begin to see. If I put it in your hands, it's safe. Isn't that cool? How many feel that that's, that's can you feel that's inside of you? That that's what you are? Ah. We forgot to hit the button. Okay, here we go. So I could say, and God, it was with you, and you were a prosperous individual, and he was in the house of where you work, and, he, and they saw that you were, pro, you were of God. You see what I'm saying? That's what people should be saying. My God, I am so thankful I have you. Is what people said about Joseph, they should say the same thing about you. Don't hit that button.
Okay. Now, Deuteronomy 28. Now, I'm going to show you this. Let's go into Deuteronomy 28. Do, 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 do. Deuteronomy. Do numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28. Now, this deals with those who do pursue God, who want God's thoughts, God's images, God's priorities. They accept their identity that God gave them. And guess what happens? I want you all to read this while I speak it, right? Chapter 28. And it shall come to pass that thou shalt hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God. You have to be receiving revelation to hear God's what? Did Joseph fit that category? The answer is what? Yes. To observe and to do all the commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Why does it say overtake? Why does it say overtake? Because some people don't want God to bless them now. They want to have God bless them in the resurrection. So what they would do is do good things and then run so God couldn't bless them. God says, don't, you can't pull that. It's not, it's going to sneak up on you and get you. The blessings are going to come if you try and outrun them. Now, <laughs> I'm going to do this thing. And God will, you know, God's got you. You're blessed. You understand? You can't outrun God's blessings. They're going to get you. I mean, blessing is going to get you. Blessing is going to get you. All right. <laughs> and these blessings shall come upon thee and what? Overtake thee, in case you wanted to think about running away from them. If thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. If God tells you to do something, but you've got to have that heart, soul, and mind so that God can talk to you, or else you're not going to be able to hear his voice. Blessed shall thou be in the city, and blessed shall thou be in the field. It doesn't matter if you're in the city or in the field, you're going to be able to receive what? Revelation. Blessed shall thou be the fruit of thy body. I, that means your strength, everything your body can do, your skills will increase, your ability will increase. And the fruit of thy ground, whatever you put in the ground, you'd be like having a magical green thumb. People say, well, you can't grow, can't grow plants in your house. I got plenty of plants growing in my house. <laughs> it's like, you can do it. And the fruit of thy cattle. I don't have, you know, I have moo, moo animals, but, you know. And the increase of thy kind, another moo animal. That's the kind, that's the male person. And the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed you shall be thy basket and thy storehouse. What's in between a basket and a storehouse? Basket is that which you can, that you Every day you go to the market, you come back with a basket, right? We have a basket of fruit, right? Those are only good for a couple of days, then we replenish it. A storehouse is there to live off of one day a week and one month a year and one year every, uh, every 49. That's what the storehouse is for. So you live off of it. If you have to pull from it, you put it back with what? Interest. That's why all the Jews never run out of money. Because they have a what? Storehouse. So that's between you and God. That's what God will increase. Your, your normal basket is what you consume daily, but your storehouse is separate. It's not your bank account. It's different. And you pull from it when you need, and then you put it back with what? Interest, usually 2 or 3%. Don't, you wouldn't give yourself a high interest rate, I guess, but, but that's what it's for. So you always have cash on hand that you're building. You don't have to go and borrow someone's money. You don't have to use your credit card, which they charge you like 15% or whatever. Charge yourself something. Just build your own storehouse. God will bless it and increase it. Does that make sense? All right. Bless your little storehouse and thy baskets. Verse 6. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in, and, when, and blessed shall be when thou goest out. Whatever you begin and whatever you end will always be beneficial. Does that make sense? How many have started something and go, wow, wasn't that bad after all? I thought it was going to be really intense, and it wasn't that bad. Nobody? I mean, everybody's going, mm -hmm. yeah. Because you start, like, oh, my, this is going to be so hard. And it's like, that wasn't so hard. So she decided to be an apiarian. 
you know, she plays with apes. No, it's a, it's a beekeeper. Apiarian, ape, anyway. And she thought, oh, look at me so hard. It's not that hard. You, you, you don't want, you do want to wear a suit, though. <laughs> not a tie. Now I'm talking about full body armor. Yeah. The Lord shall cause thy enemies that rise up against thee. All right, ever had someone against you? Someone said bad things about you. Someone made, made tell everybody how terrible you are. Guess what happens to them? Whatever is given to you is returned tenfold. Do you understand? If someone says that they are blessed by you, then they get blessed tenfold. If they go against you, then the very attitude they get tenfold comes back on them. Did you know that? How many have experienced it? The people used to hassle you got ten times worse coming back at them. You're like, what happened? I, not that you did it. It's just the way it works. The Lord shall cause thy enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. Thou, they shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. That's, in, that's amazing, but that's the way it works. Make sure you do what God says, and they will run. The Lord shall command the blessings upon thee in thy storehouses, which I've already explained to you, and in all that thou settest thy hand unto. And he shall bless thee in the land where the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself. You individually makes one. And he shall, as he has sworn unto thee, if thou, if, if thou will keep the commandments of the Lord, have his thoughts, his priorities, see from his perspective. And walk in his what? Ways. You see that? Walking, that's thinking, valuing what he values. And all the people of the earth, and it doesn't matter who meets you, all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord. Is Joseph following this? To the T. And they shall be what? Afraid of thee. <laughs> I kid you not. This stuff really works. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, in the fruit of thy cattle, in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers to give thee. And the Lord shall open unto thee his good what? Now, what kind of treasures do God have? What is it? Pardon? Greater knowledge, greater wisdom. God's thoughts, images. He'll open up more and more. The heaven to give thee rain in thy land. What's rain? Water coming down, right? Rain unto thy land in season and to bless all the work of thy hand and thou shalt lend unto many Everybody's going to come to you to borrow, and thou shalt not what? You will never have needs. Isn't that cool? And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. What's wrong with being the tail? It stinks, yeah. <laughs> being the tail stinks. God wants you to be the what? The head. How many here want to be the tail? I just love being the tail. It's the best part. To, no, it's not. It's not the best part to be. Nobody wants to be the tail. I mean, people, pff, you're supposed to be, repeat after me, I am destined to be the head. Go. I am destined to be the head. You are. Not the tail. Got it. Whose will is that? God's will. If you read this every day, in the morning and in the night before you go to bed, it will change your thinking. And the moment you stop, you go back to the way you were. You need to have daily what? Reminders. It's only a chapter, not even a chapter. It's how many verses? 13. Yeah, 13 verses. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only. How many, can, how many can handle that? 
you will constantly be promoted. Now, is there anybody I know that's in that state? Yes. They got to the highest position possible, and they're getting ready to be promoted again. They're going to make up a whole new, new position for them. Same situation. You've been promoted already. See, it, just the way it works. They need people like you at the top. They got lots of people at the bottom. Everybody likes being around the tail. Not me. <laughs> being at the tail stinks. Ready? Go. Being at the table stinks. <laughs> God wants you to be the what? The yeah. head. That's what it says. I'm showing it to you. This is for God's servants, and you're his sons. How much more is it for you? Then shall thou be, thou shall not be beneath, if thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, to observe and to what? Which means to have God's thoughts, God's images, God's priorities, see from God's perspective, accept what he says about you, and act on it. That's how hard it is. It's not hard at all. You are what God says you are. You have what God says you have, and you can do what God says you can do. <coughs> this is hot stuff. Psst. Deuteronomy 28. Know that verse. It works. It's the truth. It's what God said. All right, let's go back to Joseph, 39. All right, so verse 39, chapter 39. Chapter 39, verse 1. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him at the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Is God fulfilling his word? Yes. Is he, is he accomplishing his destiny? Yes. Step by what? Step. And Spanish is called peso a peso. No, paso a paso. Paso a paso. <laughs> and, this, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hands. And Joseph found grace. In other words, he found him to be a man of God, that God's, God's dwelling place. And he served him, and he, was, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had, he put in his hand. And it came to pass from that time that he had made him overseer in the house, over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. He left all that he had in Joseph's hands, and he knew not aught what he had, save the bread he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person, well favored. And it came to pass. I have no idea how a woman would, if a woman saw someone like that, they would just go, oh, I'm in love. I, I've met women that are really sharp and I'm going, oh, I'm in love. It just happens, you know. But I think she has something more in mind. I'm not sure. came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon him. And she said, lie with me. Nah, she doesn't tell the truth. No, that's not what it's talking about. But anyway, he's talking about having intimate and he's not going to do it. And he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wath not that is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath into my hand. So he's not going to do this. Why? She's not, I'm sure she's, you know, a trophy wife. But there is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept anything back from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against Potiphar. No. Sin against who? God. That's intense. He, he, he wants to be approved by who? God. He will not endanger his relationship with God, no matter what. I don't care how beautiful she is. I don't care how gorgeous she is. Whatever, he's just not going to do it. That's awesome. Wow. And it came to pass as she spoke to Joseph day by day. Wow. That he hearkened not unto her to lie with her, nor to be with her. Whew. Talk about a rough life. All right. <laughs> like I told you, now there is a, there is a dialco pursuing her, but not for what you would think. Right? And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. And there was none of the men in the house there within. And she caught him by his garment. 
saying, lay with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. It came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and she was, and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spoke unto them, saying, See, he has brought a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I created with a loud voice. Oh, good gravy. What did Joseph do wrong? Nothing. Why did she do this? Because she's probably afraid of getting caught. That her husband would find out whatever, so she's going to let him be the scapegoat. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Came to pass, right, and she laid up his garment by her until the Lord came home. And she spoke unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto mock me. And it came to pass, as I lifted my voice and cried, he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, when his master heard the words of his wife, that he spoke unto him, saying, After this manner did the servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. He's really upset. And Joseph's master took him and put him into prison. Well, that sucks. What did he do wrong? Why didn't God, why didn't God protect him? Why didn't God do something? You see, you and I have no idea what's coming up. We do know that God's overseeing us. So that's not the problem. We need to recognize that God's in charge. So if something happens to it, it's not more than we can handle. And God will make sure it's for our growth and what? Development. We may think it's a, it's a bad deal. You know, like David facing a lion and a bear. Like, no, 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 no. God knows what we can handle. And he's not going to give us more than we can handle. It's for our what? Growth and what? Development. You will not lose. Does that make sense? Anyway, so he's now getting thrown into prison. Do you do anything wrong? No. So what's going to happen in prison? What's going to happen in prison? Has Joseph changed? Does he still have his eye on his goal? And what God has shown him, the images, he still sees them. They're still real to him. So if he's still with God, then God's not, God's not going anywhere. God's going to be with what? With him. So he put him in the prison. Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph. Why? Because Joseph wouldn't let go of who? God and his images, his perspective, his reality. And showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the what? Here we go again. Guess who's going to wind up in charge of the prison? And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisoners. All the prisoners. All of the, he, what is Joseph? A prisoner. Who's in charge of the prisoners? Prison Joseph. No, wait, wait, wait. Can, can imagine, you know, going to visit the jail and, you know, okay, I, I want to speak to the warden, okay? Warden, who's in charge? The prisoner. You got the prisoners in charge of the prison? Yeah. He's, he's, <laughs> Everywhere Joseph goes, he's what? He's in charge. That's all he's ever known his whole life. He's in charge. He was in charge in his family. He was in charge of Potiphar. Now he's in the prison. Now he's in charge there too. And no one argues with him. He's always been the head. That's right. Always. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hands all the prisons that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he authorized it. Everything had to be done through him. And the keeper of the prison looked not on anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Wow. Not like being the prisoner and being in charge of the prison. How I many he could do that? <laughs> you walk into a business and you're in charge of it. No matter where you, no matter what they do to you, you always wind up in charge. That's your destiny. Chapter 40, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker were offended, had offended the lord, the king, the king of Egypt. All right, we're talking about a baker and a what? 
butler, right? Butler usually gives him wine. All right, so I, did, I was supposed to go to 720. Seven, I went way past that, I guess. Well, well, well. I get excited about this. It's really awesome because that's talking about you. If that's true for a servant, what about you? It should be even more so. Everything that he touches is prosperous. Everything he does, and God gives him and shows him how to do a better way, how to make it more better, how to make it more careful, making it more economical, whatever it is, he's got it. Now, if you get a chance to reread this, I imagine it'd be pretty cool. It'd be pretty interesting. I mean, you'll be really put yourself in Joseph's position. What would you have done? Make sure that you are the head and not the what? The tail. Remember, I told you that when you, if you go, if you're having a business, who would you hire? Right? You would hire someone that came in early. That person, if you had people that came in, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll hire me. So you hired them. They didn't even show up for work. They didn't do anything. They're there on payday, but not the rest of the week. Others come in there, and they just sit in their desk and don't do anything. And you're paying them by the hour, and they don't do anything, except talk to everybody. But this one person, not only does he arrive a half an hour early, runs up and clocks in on time, goes back to his desk and works his ass off, and then come lunch, he has his lunch he brought with him, clocks out for lunch, eats his lunch while he's working, then clocks out, clocks back in, and, and goes back to work, works until it's time to clock out, clocks out and goes back and finishes his job and comes to you and asks you, how can I do a better job? Which one are you going to promote? Which one are you going to increase wages? You don't want to lose this person. What about God? That's why we have an instruction booklet. Right, so in chapter 40, verse 1, it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended the Lord, the king of Egypt. And the Pharaoh was wroth with the two of them, of his officers, under, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continued the season in ward. And they dreamed a dream. Both of them, each man his dream in one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream. The butler and the baker of the king of Egypt that were bound in the prison. Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them and said, Behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sad today? And they said one to another, We have dreamed a dream, and I have no idea what the heck it's all about. We have no one to interpret it. Joseph said unto them, do not interpretation belong to who? Whoa. Tell me, I pray. Wait a minute. They belong to God. Why does it say tell me? If God does the interpreting, why does it say tell me? He's God's Azir. He's what? He's the prosthesis. Yeah, he's, pro he's God's ears. He's God's mouth. And who else? Do you know anyone in this room that has that? Who in this room has this? We are. All right, that's good. This is how you get revelation. Put yourself in the position. Ask God. Don't go by your intellect and emotions. Just ask God. And what God shows you and reveals to you, that's it. Then you tell him what God has shown you. Don't let your emotions get in there. Go prosuche, go to God, let go of everything, and just, you know, just go to God, and God will give you the answer. Isn't that cool? Get in the practice, make it second nature to where it's automatic. All right. All right, and verse 9. And the chief butler told the dream to Joseph and said to him, My dream, behold, the vine was before me, and the vine was three branches, and it was though it would budded, 
and the blossoms shot forth, and the cluster thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And the Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and squished them, pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, <laughs> and I gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand. Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. Three branches are three days. Yet within three days shall the Pharaoh lift up thy head, be it restore thee to thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former matter in which thou was his butler. But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me in this dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, Hey, hey, I also dreamed a dream. And behold, I had white baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket there was all manner of baked meats for the Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof. Three baskets are three days, yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off of thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off of thee. Well, that sucks. <laughs> and it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler and of the chief baker among his servants. And he restored the chief butler to his butlership again and gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker. Why did he hang the chief baker? Does anybody know why? Look at the pharaohs. Look at all the pharaohs that we found. What's wrong with them? Broken teeth. The purpose of the baker is to ensure that all stones, remember they, what do they do, how do they make bread? They grind it on a what? On rocks, right? And sometimes a piece of that rock goes out and they just put it together and they make bread and he goes to bite it and crack tooth. Another cracked tooth. All the pharaoh's teeth were all cracked. We can look at them. I mean, you, they don't look very good, but you can see, see the teeth. They're all cracked. That means someone gave the pharaoh, I imagine he went through a lot of, a lot of bakers. <laughs> but every pharaoh has that. It doesn't start off that way, but as they get older, they think, oh, and they go, and all of a sudden, teeth breaks. They get abscessed teeth. It's like, wow. So, and chapter 41, guess who has a dream now? Pharaoh. Yep. Number one, um, when you, which I thought was really an awesome question, when, remember, when you get Revelation, you're supposed to get to be sure that it's absolutely from God, you get it what? Twice. Don't ask for a third one. There won't be a third. But twice. Okay? So, when you go to God, you ask God what to do, and God will tell you. Is that going to be enough? No, there's word of knowledge, and then word of what? Wisdom. Wisdom. You have to know how to do it, or you're going to mess it up. And then you can ask for a second time to verify, and God will tell you a second time. Sometimes what I do is I ask someone else, would you go to God on it? They go to God. God tells them the same thing that pretty much establishes it. So that makes sure it's not me coming from my own brains. And they said, we have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me. Tell me. Wait a minute. They belong to God. Tell me. Why? If someone says, I dreamed a dream. And you say, well, interpretations belong to God. And then you say what? Clear your mind. Get rid of everything. Make sure your heart, your emotions are involved. And then go to God. And God will reveal what's going on. Got it? Don't let your emotions dictate. So when you only want to know what God's saying, if God says, I did not speak to them, that's not for me, then you tell them. Okay? It's probably because of a movie you watched last night or something. <laughs> I had this dream. A guy with a mask was chasing me with a knife. What did you watch last night? All right. All right, you understand that our input usually comes out in our dreams. So you control your input, you control your dreams, you control your life. But if you don't control it, then you're going to be going through all kinds of weird stuff. Now, 41, 1 through 15. There we go. That's where we want to be. 
And it says, And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine and fat shed, fat flesh. That means they were heavy. And they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other kinds came out after out of the river. And an ill-favored and lean-fleshed stood by the river and the kind on the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean-fleshed kind did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke. That's a pretty wild dream. But what does the cows represent? What does the, the, the actual kind, the cattle, represent? So as you keep reading, when you see it in the Bible and other places, you'll know what it means. Because if you get down to... So he gets the dream, and in verse 9, then spoke the chief butler unto Pharaoh, because he, he didn't know what to do about the dreams. I do remember my false this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me in the ward and the captain of the king's the guard's house both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, a, a, a Hebrew, servant of the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted us our dreams. Came to, and verse 13, it came to pass as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored to mine office, and him he hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. What did he do? He what? shaved himself, right? Just because you get a chance to talk to a senator or a congressman or the president of another state or a prince, you dress the part to go before them. The example of Joseph is excellent. So if you're going to go to a senator, don't wear your flip-flops and shorts, all right? God calls you to go to a senator, and the, the opportunity you get to be with a senator, learn protocol and be respectful just like Joseph was, because God will open that door for you. And if you make a total disaster out of it, it's not God's fault. So will you be, will you be in the presence of princes? Yes, you will. Will you be in the presence of foreign, nation, foreign executives or officers or presidents? Yeah, you will. I've been in the presence of Marcos, the president of the Philippines, and other presidents of different countries. You get known you're going to get attention from people of positions and power. Be ready to handle that. Learn protocol, okay? And it will happen. So certain things you don't do, <laughs> other things, you know, but it all depends on who you're going to see. Mm. So he calls for him. He dresses and shaves himself, changes his raiment, and came in, so he wanted to dress the part of being a court, member of the court. Joseph said unto Pharaoh, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard of, say thee, that thou can interpret a dream to interpret it. Now, how do you think Joseph answered? Yes, I'm the one. I'm the one. No, he didn't do that. Joseph answered Pharaoh and saying, it's not what? In me. It's not me that's so great. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. You're here to speak for who? God. You're God's what? Prothesis. Remember that? God has no mouth but your mouth. God has no hands but your hand. Pharaoh spoke unto Joseph in my dream. He tells the dream. And when it, right, and we go down in verse 25. Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of the Pharaoh is one. God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do or allow to be done. It's what God's allowing. The seven good kind are seven years. So what does each kind represent? One yeah. what? One year. And the, and the seven, all right, and the seven good years of corn is one, is, is seven years. The dream is one. And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after the seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh, what God is about to do, allow to be done, show it unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come a seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of what? Famine. Does that make sense? Okay. And, that, and there shall arise after seven years of famine, and all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, 
and the famine shall consume the land, and the plenty shall be known in the land by reason of the famine following, for it shall be very grievous. For that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh, what? Twice, right? It was given to him, what? Twice. When you go to God and you're not sure, it, it, you go to God and ask him again, he, he will do it. But if you ask him three times, the answer, there's not going to be an answer. Got it? That's why the Bible's here, so we know. The thing is established by God, and God will surely bring it to pass. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man. Let Pharaoh look out a man, discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. Pharaoh's going. <laughs> well, if you were Pharaoh, who would you choose? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now, okay. Set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this. Let him appoint officers over the land. Take up fifth part of the land of Egypt in seven plenteous years. Why not a tenth? Why a fifth? Notice it's two what? Two tenths is one fifth. So, who is the person who stands for God? So one tenth should go to God, another tenth should go for the storehouse. So Egypt's going to have its own storehouse. So that will be the full tenth. That'll be two tenths, one for God and one for the storehouse. He's going to keep it there. Isn't that cool? So two tenths is a, because when you, when you have an income, one tenth goes to God, one tenth goes to your what? Storehouse. If you pull from it, you put it back with interest. So it's always growing. And that way you're covered. And that's at the, that lean times, you pull from that. You don't pull from your savings. That's totally different. All right. Now let do this and let him appoint. Okay, we did that. Let them gather all the food of those good years that come. Lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh. Let them keep food in the cities. That the food shall be for store for the land against the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a man as this, a man in whom what? The Spirit of God is. How did Pharaoh know? How do people know that you've got the Spirit of God? How do they know? Do you tell them? Walk around with sunglasses and say, do you know who I am? Or my signature? <laughs> put, a, put a label on it says, son of God. God's dwelling place. No. Do the word and you watch God bring it. Does that make sense? Pharaoh said unto Joseph, for as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou. There's no one more wiser than you. I'm going to repeat it again. There's no one more wiser than you. Why? Because you have the instruction manual. You have the examples. You cannot lose. All you got to do is try. If you make a mistake, that's not the fact that you walked on the word. That's, remember that? You have that goal. The goal. What kind of a person you want to be. You see that where that goal is, and that's what you're going to be? Every step you take. So you stumble. Big deal. Get back up and keep going. The goal is still the same. That's your what? Destiny. It's what God has declared you to be. Remember that? You should be the head and not the what? Verse 40. Thou shalt be over my house... And according to uh, un, unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, understand, look, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And the Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand. What, what, is, does that mean they're married? No. What, what does that mean when he takes it? What's that ring? Right, it's the signet ring, the seal. He's taking off his hand and giving it to who? 
So all laws for the land will now be given by who? Joseph, not Pharaoh. He has a signet ring. What else did he do? And arrayed him in a vesture of fine linen. And that's the best there is. Some people say it's silk. And put a gold chain about his neck. That's the highest honor there is. And he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had. Can you imagine President Trump giving you his second car to drive? Here, you need a car? Use my second car. Says, you know, President of the United States. <laughs> Wouldn't that be intense? And he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried before him, bow the knee. Everybody, when he shows up, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand. What does that mean? Lift up his hand. You mean everybody has to walk with their hands by their side like this? What does it mean to lift up your hand? To take action in any way. Just to do any action. Without Joseph's authorization, nothing. Or foot. That how people should think, he's going to tell them what they should think in all the land of Egypt. Well, that's pretty intense. By the way, how old was he? 30 years old. So, and Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it's not what? In me, it's not me. I'm going to who? God. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And in 41, 17 to 24, and Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. God has shown Pharaoh what he's about to do. So God will show you what's about to happen. God's just going to let you know. Genesis 41, 26 to 31. We covered that. For the dream was doubled on the Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is what? Established. It's absolute. You can go to God twice and ask him what, and he will tell you. Don't go a third time, twice. And then you can ask for how to handle it. How does God want it done? Remember, you're God's who? You're God's what? Azir, right? You're representing him. You're his prothesis. You're making things. God doesn't have a mouth but yours. He doesn't have hands but yours. Does that make sense? Forty-one, thirty-three through 37. I don't know if I've got it. Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the what? Spirit of God. Do you know anyone who's got the Spirit of God? Yeah. All right, he knows one. All right, anyone else know anyone? <laughs> anyone here know anyone who's got the Spirit of God? Yeah. There are a lot of people have it. The question is, do they what? Use it. It's great to have a cell phone, but if you got it turned off, you ain't going to get no calls, right? Oh, got to turn it on. For as much as God has showed thee all these things, there is none so discreet and wise as thou. Thou shalt be over my house, and according to thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be better than thou. Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand. You have all my authority and power. Whoa. And put it on Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of linen, fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. Made him to ride in this. What is this? Joseph is now the Pharaoh's what? Azir. And you are God's what? Azir. Remember, and we know that all things, well, how much stuff did Joseph go through? All that stuff. All things. What about what David went through? All things. What about Joseph? All things work together. They synergize. Remember? When someone pursues you, good or bad, God's going to give you revelation. Good or bad, to them that love God. To them who are called according to His, God's purposes. Got it? That's your destiny. And when Joseph came home, 
Now, remember, what was his original dream? That his brothers would bow what? Bow down to him, remember? Well, when you get into chapter 43, and when Joseph came home, they brought him the present, which was in their hand, into the house, his house, and bowed themselves to him, to the earth. Whoa! Isn't that part of his dream? Then God showed him that was going to happen? Here it is. And he asked them of their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you speak? Is he yet alive? And they all answered, Thy servant, our father, is in good health. He is yet alive. And they bowed their heads and made obstinance. There you go. And imagine at that point he just went, Wow. Everything God showed him happened. Because that was what he kept as his goal, that pursuit, that goal, that image. And then God revealed more and more the closer he got to it. How do I know? Because of what he says here. 45, 4, and 8. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt, you assholes. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> whom you sold into what? Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve what? Life. Otherwise, they would have perished. Who knew ahead of time? God did. Did God tell him everything? No. God just showed him his brothers bowing down to him. And as he got closer and closer to the final goal, God revealed what? More and more and more. Does that make sense? For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are, there are still what? Five more years. In the which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but what? God. All things work to the good. It, whose plan was this? God's. Who brought to pass? Joseph. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh. Oh, wow. What does that mean? Remember, I told you, it's someone who teaches you, who is superior in an aspect. His house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Wow. So every time you had a bad situation, it's just like, ooh, what am I gaining from this? What knowledge am I gaining? What experience am I gaining? What skill am I gaining? How has this made me increase? What has, made, what has it made me able to handle next? Does that make sense? Romans 8.28 and we know that all things work together, work together for good. Now, we covered this. This is synergy, right? You get more. God by himself and you together with God, God can do more. You can do more. Believe me, you can do a lot. <laughs> it's like, wow. For good to them that agape God, to them who are called according to his what? Was Joseph called for a purpose? Yes. Did he finally realize it? Yes. Did it make sense as he was going through it? Not so much. But then it became evident. That's all things. Are you blessed? I just want my whole life to be roses. Well, how about the thorns? <laughs> no, we don't want no thorns. It's the roses. No. Roses come with what? Thorns. Father, thank you for the great privilege of teaching your word. Thank you for the hearts of each person that hears your word, that they can truly grow and develop and be even greater than they've ever imagined, because they are never to be alone. That is having you dwelling within them, and that they can manifest your presence. Thank you for their skill as an azir, continue to increase, and to be able to hear your words clearly, to receive your revelation, and then truly manifest you within them into the world. So I thank you for all the great things we're yet to do and accomplish and give you all the praise and glory as we walk in the footsteps of your firstborn from the dead, our risen and return Lord Jesus. 
you're anointed. Ready? Here we go. You are, gosh, what? Best. Best. Oh, wow. I love you.